manager for the um, Lombard Historical Society. And so uh, Lombard is located about 20 miles just due west of downtown Chicago. Um, and this is a community that truly does have a very deep history. Um, we've been incorporated since 1869, um, but the first European settlers came um, in the late 1830s to the area. Um, and our organization was founded in 1970 out of our centennial celebration for the town. Uh, and so really with uh, how we approach history kind of just in general is we really look to see how our local history and our local stories connect deeper into the national overarching stories. And so having conversations about um, fair housing practices, um, you know, the, the race relations that were happening in the 1940s and 50s. These are um, conversations that a lot of time, especially with students that we see at the overarching national, we see how they play out in Washington and on the big names. Um, but it's a lot of important work is also help happening at local levels. And so having um, documentaries like Common Good, being able to share the stories that happen with the people in your community um, is just as impactful, if not more impactful um, at certain points. So we really do like to say that history isn't what happened in the 1800s. It truly is, um, you know, what's happening yesterday, what happened 20 years ago. Um, and like I said, we really, especially at LHS, look to um, connect both with our local um, community, but also our broader community, both in and out of state. Um, and so this was a very exciting project um, and story that we have gotten to share. And so um, it kind of started out of uh, my predecessor. She wrote a blog post um, and she had this story in her head and she posted it online. Um, and Tim, being one of our diligent followers, who is one of our biggest supporters, saw it and said, this is our next story and how do we uh, make it even bigger? So I take, um, you know, it is my pleasure that I, we are able to have Tim with us here tonight because truly um, this story would not have been told to the level without him. So it's, I always love when I get to shine a spotlight on one of our favorite community partners. Um, so with that, I said my presentation was very brief. So I don't know if you have anything initially that you want to add in, um, Tim, at this point, or? Well, it, certainly flattering that you all watched the film. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm curious, did you watch it uh, as, a, as a group or did you watch it individually? We watch it individually as people have time and then we meet as a Zoom to discuss or hear about aspects of a film. So that's yeah. our general thing. Well, uh, I think if I could share an important concept, the word documentary is, uh, is rather loose these days. And, and I take a sort of traditional um, approach to documentary. That is that when I begin to tell a story, I don't have any agenda or at least I try my best not to have an agenda. I, I find a story that's interesting and the Lombard Historical Society wrote this blog post that Ray mentioned and um, it talked about this community and I was uh, surprised because I've lived in Lombard for 30 plus years and I didn't know the story. How could this amazing story have, you know, I knew nothing about. So it intrigued me but I had no agenda. And what drew me to the story was the concept of community. Um, my sons are police officers and it is a common occurrence here in Chicago. And I suppose it happens in Lawrence that uh, first responders get a phone call and a person has expired in their home um, some weeks previous. And then they were not discovered. Um, I've shared this phenomena with my, I, I travel a lot with uh, some of my sub-Saharan African friends and it blows their mind. Um, they see the United States as a 
so-called civilized country, but to an African mind that an elder could expire alone is just very difficult to get your mind around how that could possibly happen. The York Center Community Cooperative was a community in the truest sense of the word. Um, they shared one another's burdens, they shared resources, they, they, um, they, one person in the documentary said, we knew people by their silhouette. Uh, uh, children would often go into neighbors' homes just as a matter of course, like without, uh, you know, the door's not locked, you just walk in, that kind of thing. When they, when they delivered milk, uh, the delivery person would just open the door, walk into the kitchen, open the refrigerator and put the milk in. So what, what drew me to the story was, was uh, community. I, was, I honestly believed before I started the documentary that white people lived in DuPage County, Illinois because they liked DuPage County, Illinois. <laughs> it was white because that's where they just wanted to live there. That was, you know, and other people <laughs> just chose not to. Um, I got an education. Uh, and, and about the time we started this documentary, um, the whole topic of critical race theory began to be forefront in the, uh, in the news and so on. This was not on my mind when I started it. So you could watch this film and think it was some sort of attempt to right wrongs of the past. I'm just reporting what I saw and heard um, and recorded. So I was unaware that prior to the 1968 Fair Housing Act, part of Johnson's Great Society, that you could not buy a home in Lombard, Illinois, if you weren't Caucasian. There were restrictive covenants in many of the subdivisions that said you cannot sell this property to a non-Caucasian. It was right there in the, in the deed. The FHA would not loan you money. You couldn't get an FHA loan if you were white in DuPage, if you were not white in DuPage County. The realty board systematically would not show properties in DuPage County. All of this came out in, in research. And um, what I discovered is that DuPage County was white because it wanted to be white, <laughs> period. And uh, so the York Center Community Cooperative was the first integrated housing in DuPage County. There was an epic housing shortage in, uh, in Chicago and around the, the nation after World War II. And uh, you know people were stacked on top of each other in apartment blocks in the city. And there was this huge demand for housing. And some of these seminary professors in Chicago wanted, um, wanted a home of their own. And well, you saw the film, they bought a dairy farm and, and, uh, and followed these Rochdale principles come, coming out of England and, uh, and formed a community and anyone could live there if you followed the rules. At least that was the idea until an African-American wanted to move in and then they thought better of it. <laughs> they had to vote some people off the island. And, uh, but then after, after they got their priorities in order, uh, it was the first integrated housing in DuPage County, and it had African Americans, Jews, um, quite a few uh, Japanese who had been interred in the camps during World War II uh, came there, uh, and they were all denied opportunities for housing in DuPage County. But the York Center Community Cooperative was different, and uh, and so that was the whole genesis for the story. And we were able to interview some of the original members and um, quite a bit of ephemera, photographs, you know, film, home movies, that kind of thing uh, that helped us to tell the story. So uh, we're, we're, we're proud of it. I also, also should mention that uh, this is the third in a series of documentaries. A fourth is in production that we've collaborated with the uh, Lombard Historical Society. It's a, uh, a model of collaboration that I, I wish was more common around the country. Uh, the Lombard Historic Society has been a tremendous partner um, to work with. They provide me with uh, support, with um, 
with gravitas. You know, if, if a crazy documentary producer calls you on the phone and says, I want to interview you, <laughs> it's much more easy for me to get the interview if I say, yeah, I'm producing a documentary with the Lombard Historical Society. <laughs> <laughs> They are they are they're wonderful, and they also keep me honest uh, because their um, their their credentials in terms of historians are impeccable, and and if we said it in the documentary, it's because they looked at it and said yes, that's actually the case. So they're just great, right. can, and I, and I love working. A, with them. a quick question: Can can you or can Ray please send me those other documentaries and? Uh, where the other one, rather than put it in chat where I won't be able to write fast enough, if she can email it to me, I'll pass that along because I, for one, would be interested. This one was really well done and I'd like to see uh, the additional ones. Absolutely, we can. I can do that. It's uh, they, they, they tell a very nice story of Lombard and uh, we're very, uh, you know, sometimes you have people who's come up to you and say, oh, I want to make a documentary and you sometimes are like, okay, but what are your credentials? And we have never, ever had that worry with Tim. We know whatever product he's going to produce is going to be exceeding our standards. So it's really, um, we're very fortunate that we do have such a great partnership to just lift both organizations um, up. We do We do have one comment in the, in the uh, chat. I'm gonna uh, mention it kind of backwards. The, the uh, thought is about the movie itself. I thought the film was so watchable because of the interviews and the way it flowed with the video aspects. So uh, to, to your you know, credit, uh, but uh, the same person also mentioned that the, the same restrictions existed, not just in Lombard, but uh, she particularly mentions Kansas City, but it was national. You have to remember the F in FHA is federal. So it was pretty much true around the country. Um, uh, the Historical Society in Johnson County, which is uh, out, outside, you know, outside of Kansas City, uh, not, not Lawrence, but outside of Kansas City, had a terrific display on redlining and uh, specifically in the Kansas City and St. Louis areas. So we're aware of it. Uh, the other question is what year was the film made? This is the, oh, go ahead. Pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah. we. I believe we started making it because um, we really, so part of it was um, when the pandemic happened is obviously as a museum, we had to shift. Um, and so that's really when we did a redesign of our website. We had a blog going um, and so we wanted to hit it. So I, um, you know, just continue to kind of up that and still work on connecting um, specifically virtually during that time when we weren't allowed to be in person. And so I believe um, that blog was written towards the end of 2020. And I think a lot of the filmmaking was done in 2021. Um, and then we had a big premiere <laughs> in 2021 um, at the end of the summer where uh, we were very fortunate. It was one of probably the coolest things um, with this is that a lot of the people who were in the film and their families, um, we had like a hundred people at the opening. We had a huge outdoor screen that we blew up. Um, and so it was really- uh, Well, yeah, that's when, that's when people could, could you know, the first time where you could gather, yeah. but they had to be outdoors, yeah. Yep. So yeah, so people who got the, uh, I saw a number of people uh, jostling their neighbor when they would come on the screen and pointing and kind of, not poking fun at them for being a part of it, but like, look at you up there, you big movie star kind of, um, you know, uh, feeling throughout the crowd. And it's, it was especially really special because um, a lot of these people, you know, with the co-op's um, demise, unfortunately, and as just, you know, people move away, um, some of these people hadn't seen each other in, I think, decades at this point. And so they were able to come back together. And so, um, the community spirit really did um, continue to linger on, which was really nice, especially coming at a time where this was like kind of the first time that people were seeing each other in, in person. So this was the, the timing of when we made this could not have um, been more at a time when we were all seeking community. So it was very poignant. One of the themes that we employ in, in all of our documentaries is that um, it's a local story. 
I, I can't compete with Ken Burns. God bless Ken Burns. I love him. He's my hero. But I, you know, <laughs> he's got a, he's got a fleet of producers and, and you know budgets from corporate sponsors that are, you know, I mean, there, there's there's six of us in my company. Me, myself, and I, the Father, Son, <laughs> and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> So I, I can't compete with, with, you know, I can't do the Civil War or jazz or baseball. But what we can do is local stories. But local doesn't mean that it doesn't have broader implications. So the issues of fair housing, as you point out, are universal. Uh, the themes that that are spoken of in this film are, are themes that Americans experienced uh, across the board. Um, and even though it was a, in Little Lombard, Illinois, Oh, it was Thurgood Marshall himself, uh, the Supreme Court Justice, who uh, who uh, wrote a legal brief and uh, and advocated with Harry Truman to uh, to issue an executive order that um, that essentially directed the FHA to stop their uh, practices of denying mortgages to um, non non Caucasians. So. Little little towns, when they get together and get their act together and start to have a, a, vo a common voice, can make big changes. And Lombard has proved that over and over. Um, one, of, one of the questions that I did have is, at the peak of its size as a co-op, what was the population and what was the diversity uh, of it? And how does that compare to the area today? Yeah, uh, the uh, I believe there were at, at its peak nine, uh, something like sixty houses, maybe. I think so. Sounds. Uh, I think in terms of the diversity, um, I don't have figures, but uh, I can tell you that there were. Quite a few African Americans, uh, not just a, a token um, Japanese, um, Jewish families, uh, um, South Asians. Uh, so it was very diverse, and remains that neighborhood remains diverse today. Uh, I think that was my question. It, it stayed that way. It, it became a permanent but way of, course, of life. DuPage County is diverse. Yes, <laughs> it, it's, it yeah. is. It is epically diverse. Uh, so, so it is no longer a, a, a white enclave. It, yeah. but so the co-op, the co-op, or the the that that housing community today uh, reflects the broader DuPage County. They just led the way. Okay. They weren't radical. They were early. Um, we do have a question at at, at when the co-op kind of dissolved mm -hmm. at that point. What percentage of the members stayed on, even though the co-op itself was dissolved? Was right, it most of them, just a few. Did people move away? There was a group when that when it dissolved that moved moved to actually California, mm -hmm. um, and and joined some other uh, housing co-ops, but not a large a group. There's a number of original people still living in the York Center um, community. Uh, uh, people moved, you know, throughout the the decades. Uh, the, the deal was you owned your home, but the co-op owned the property. So there was one uh, mortgage for the entire housing development. This was part of their problem is that they couldn't get refinancing. No bank wanted to, banks want to make money and they wanted to individual mortgages. And, and, uh, uh, the co-op only had one mortgage. So banks were like, man, we're not making any money on this, you know, and nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to uh, give them a, a, a mortgage. And uh, so that diversity, it, it changed over, over time. And, uh, and a, a number of people have stayed. They're still there today that were part of the co-op. Uh, also the real estate value mm -hmm. around the co-op um, escalated over the decades. And by the 2000s, um, you know, property values for single family homes, these are big lots. They're, uh, you know, half an acre in size, many of them. And uh, they were going for 
the, the neighboring communities, you know, they were going for a lot of money. And a lot of people that had moved into the co-op after original owners had moved out, signed up for the co-op because they liked the open space. They liked the, the homes were all custom, um, kind of unusual, not the cookie cutter suburban homes. But they were not there for the egalitarian uh, uh, notions that the co-op was formed on. They weren't there um, to, you know, for a cause, for fair housing or for um, uh, for diversity. They were there because they liked the houses. And when those property values started to escalate, they a group of them wanted their, to have their own, you know, get their uh, their share of their of, of the pie and sell it, make a profit. And that's kind of what did them in eventually. Uh, you mentioned in the film, the, uh, the um, uh, McCarthy era and its, its effect. What, how much of an effect was the fact that people think of it as a commune? Was it talked about that way? Was there really that much of an effect to to that or did that just play into the times absolutely it was the york center co-op and that meant commune and that meant communists mm -hmm. so yeah. they didn't like them for that reason and they didn't like them because they were diverse um so yeah the the uh, the mccarthy scare chicago you know you had a lot of um white ethnic groups in chicago and and are you familiar with the term blockbusting? So yes. a realtor gets a hold of one property on a block, um, buys it, and then goes up and down the block and says, hey, this neighborhood's going to flip. It's going to be all black. You better sell now. That happened a lot in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of fear. Even people, I talked to, nobody wanted to go on camera, of course. Nobody wants to say that my grandmother was a racist. <laughs> <laughs> right? But- Mm -hmm. it, 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 a lot of people, I think, it wasn't necessarily what was driving them. Their their angst about the co-op wasn't necessarily racism, although I guess it could be described as systemic racism. It was just economic fear. They were worried that, you know, my parents uh, lost money on their house in Chicago when they moved out to the suburbs, and we're afraid it's going to happen again. So self-interest and uh, and financial angst was uh, drove a lot of the tension. Um, uh, early on, it was it was quite prominent. There were uh, bullet holes through windows. There were swastikas painted on doors. There were um, uh, signs posted with using the N word, uh, but that was mild compared to what the children of the co-op members faced when they went to public schools in Lombard. Uh, they had a rough time. Uh, the co-op was an oasis of um, egalitarian community, and that was not the case when they when the kids went to school. So they experienced an utterly different world when they got into the public school system, and then when they they would come home at night, and their parents, particularly the parents of color, the theme was that we want to get along, we want to be good neighbors, we want to be responsible. Uh, we want to win our neighbors over with um, uh, with our good intentions, with our hard work, with our industry, um, with our sense of neighborliness and and patriotism. They didn't want to make waves. Uh, and so the kids were just unprepared for the reality that they met when they got to school and the parents didn't quite get it. So there was this sort of divide between the the original co-op adults and their offspring uh, and what they experienced out uh, out in the community. One woman told me of taking her kids to the Lombard barbershop and uh, they wouldn't cut her their kids hair, her kids hair. Um, so uh, two women told me about uh, they couldn't go to the neighboring roller rink or the ice skating pond or uh, restaurants, that kind of thing. So the kids had a rough rougher time, I think, than the adults did. Uh, there's one more comment and uh, interesting relative to what we're talking about. 
using the word community triggers interesting reactions. In the early 70s, I was involved in a parent-run alternative school named School of Community. There were those who accused us of being communist, which was not part of the purpose at all. So once again, the universalization of exactly what you filmed. Well, this is why you guys are so great. You know, the, the education is the answer. Right, all of these, all these fears and and uh, and angst is it's just education. It's just ignorance. <laughs> and there are still people who, when I talk in Lombard about this film and the fact that the co-op even existed, there are some people who have lived in Lombard their whole life who um, either don't remember the co-op or are choosing to not remember. Um, and that, or that they don't even realize that this was something that existed within their own community at times. And so, um, they definitely, and the, the adults who I speak to, who do remember the co-op, they definitely said, oh, those were co-op kids. And there was definitely, um, an othering of, you know, even Lombardians, um, from, from the co-op. So the neighboring town, Villa Park, when, uh, when the co-op kids started, uh, you, you know, joining the public school system early on, uh, they just simply started a new school district. <laughs> <laughs> Left the uh, co-op kids by themselves. Yeah, it's interesting, of course, it's extra interesting because it's the Chicago area, which is the uber ethnic city of America. And when you have neighborhoods where the Slovakians and the Lithuanians won't speak to each other, it's really easy to jump to how difficult it is for a person of ra different racial background, particularly, to try to exist in, in, in the community. And I'm not saying they're more prejudiced than anyone else, but the, the, the city has that ethnic divide, I think, in, with more diversity than any city I know of, you know, uh, in terms of the number of, of ethnic groups and how, and how they initially at least lived in their own communities. Well, you have, you know, in uh, Kansas City, you have white suburban neighborhoods, Absolutely. you know, out, outside of the city that are, that were all white. I don't know if they still are. How, how diverse is Suburban well, Kansas City. I, I will give you, I, I can't, I, Kathleen could probably speak to this much better. She's from, from Kansas City, but I will just give you the one interesting thing. When we visited the Johnson County Historical Society Museum that's here, they talked about their efforts to become diverse. It was originally uh, a redlined area and, and uh, their efforts to come diverse and how much progress they made today as they move toward five or six percent. So that kind of answers your question. So how did this, how did the school of community turn out? Kay, do you want to okay. you want to unmute and answer? Well, I mean, we we kept going. I think we went about four years. Was about all we went, and then uh, just for various reasons, it was um, dissolved. But we just hung in there and we had to just kind of ignore the the comments that were coming our way and the the real prejudice against us then people started being really um prejudiced against us and uh, you know one one uh, teacher came and visited as, as she was trying to evaluate uh, what we were doing and uh i think that helped a little bit because she let them know that we weren't trying to do anything subversive um, but you know the school for the years that it did uh, stay was was pretty successful but we were we were down in the boot heel of Missouri so <laughs> we we you know we really we wanted to give our, our kids a a more a broader perspective of, of of learning and so we all got together and that's what we decided to do I think one of our problems was, you know, finding uh, a couple, some teachers. The parents, of course, were all supposed to help in any way they could as far as teaching, but finding, you know, core teachers was a problem. But um, 
it was, yeah, I, I mean, I had no idea just because we called it that, that people would say, but we started hearing things and started having people critical of us because, well, they're just a bunch of communists over there and they're part of, you know, people trying to overtake our democracy. And of course, that was the farthest thing from my mind. <laughs> Community is hard work, isn't it? Yes, yes. What was kind of interesting too was the school board actually supported us because they uh, they offered us you know books and supplies and whatever things that they felt uh, from that perspective that the kids need they did offer us that which was good that helped. What what are the go ahead go ahead I, I just you, you certainly have a lot of co-ops in in Kansas with uh, the farming co-ops. You know, the, the cooperative movement is far beyond housing. Um, sure. And, the, you know, the farming co-ops are a model for what what you can do when you all get together and share. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, not that it's absolutely successful in some areas, these uh, open offices that are rentable. I mean, all of that is we were the economic concept of the co-op. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I wasn't completely, and I may have missed, some, missed it, but I wasn't sure of in the film, is the original individuals who started this, was their goal primarily affordable housing or was there uh, an equity and diversity in their thoughts at that time, you know, uh, when they actually began it? The the initial impetus in 1949 was affordable housing. They were right. a group of seminary professors in Chicago, and they just could not afford. There were just no housing stock. There was no housing stock available, so they were they they wanted a place where they, you know, could spread out to have their own home, um, have good schools, that kind of thing, uh, and so they began to meet and talk and they met a um, one of their group had been a missionary in India where the uh, the cooperative movement had gotten quite a bit of traction and this Indian group um, had <coughs> learned about co-ops from the Rochdale community in England so the Rochdale community came up with a series of Rochdale principles uh, they were they were people in the uh, weavers trade in factories, you know, these big um, factories in the Midlands in the 19th century. And uh, so they, they gathered together for uh, fair wages and good working conditions and formed a co-op. But because of the history of the you know, English civil wars and the, the fights between Catholics and Protestants in England that was on their minds um, in the 19th century still, uh, the Rochdale principles were militantly secular. That was, you know, one of their real creeds. If you want to be part of our co-op, you anyone can join. You, you don't have to be a Catholic or a Protestant. That gave rise to egalitarian notions of equality in other areas, race, gender, um, education. Uh, and so as the cooperative movement developed, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, when it, when they finally encountered it here in Chicago, um, they were well codified, and so they just followed the roadmap. And the roadmap said anyone can live in the co-op if you agree to follow the rules. But they themselves, even though they were, they were progressive by their, by the standards of the day, when their attorney, an African American, by the name of Ted Robinson who helped them to incorporate said, you know, this is a pretty good idea. I'd like to live here. They were like, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> um, they, they just did. And, and he said, well, okay, fine. Um, I'll withdraw my application for membership, but you really need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, are we going to be the kind of people, are we going to be the kind of community that we say we're going to be? And they really, pardon the expression, had to come to Jesus. And uh, and a few people left the co-op. 
they moved um, rather than integrate. And that was with, within the first couple of years of the co-op. And after that, they never looked back. And that's when uh, the Japanese started to arrive and um, many other African-Americans. Oh, one of the cool things about this story, I, I didn't really get in, I have time to get into it. The, these kids of these co-opers that grew up in this community where uh, there was equality and they, they celebrated one another's cultures. They would have Hanukkah mm -hmm. parties and they would have, um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, associations with the, these kids went on to be amazing uh, uh, members of their community. Uh, uh, they just, they just tore it up. Uh, got many got advanced degrees. Uh, they, they wound up being educators and uh, medical professionals and, uh, you know, far outpaced uh, the, I think the, the average uh, Lombard, you know, student. Now there are a lot of smart people that came out of Lombard, but the co-op just cranked them out. Really, really amazing group of people. Interesting. That's very interesting. Do we have any other questions? I think there was from a anyone? question from Shelley. Uh, that said at the co-op's demise uh, about what percentage of co-op members stayed on. Yeah, I, I want to say it's people were moving all the time. Yeah, people were moving all the time. So the original co-opers by from between 1949 and 2000, you know, many of them had passed on. Mm -hmm. um, some had sold and moved for a variety of reasons. Uh, but there still are quite a few original members or their, even their children that have purchased the homes. Uh, one of the questions is, how did you find the people in the film? Right, so the uh, after the co-op dissolved, they became a, uh, uh, what's the term? Uh, HOA, I believe. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's not the, a co-op, it's a- uh, The Homeowners Association. Homeowners Association, that's yeah. it. So we reached out to the homeowners association, wow. and uh, and they um, they put out the word, and then we had a Zoom meeting that we, which was still kind of new and kind of sexy. <laughs> not, you know, it was like, and and I couldn't believe it. I think there was sixty people mm -hmm. on the Zoom meeting, um, and they were, you know, uh, that's one thing about cooperation. It it engenders community and. Boy, when they when the community heard, they came from the diaspora from all over the country, and where there was just a tremendous interest in uh, in having the story told. So, yeah. found right in the co-op. Yeah, sounds... the, there was. I say the. Co I mean, the flip side of it was it the the difficult part was finding people who didn't live in the co-op. I think you mentioned this earlier to talk about um, other people's views on the co-op and so there is uh people who were not part of the co-op did not want to talk about their experiences with it uh for better or worse i tried hard yeah. i tried hard and you know i just couldn't get anybody to i knew they knew but nobody wanted to go on and say you know what um what, what another question is when the school district broke up and i guess that's what what you said happened when they kind of started a new school. How were the kids taught? How did they end up succeeding so well? Did they start? Well, they, still had, they still had their public school. It was just a, a small, it was actually a, one of those one room schoolhouses. So it was just co op kids, but it was still a public school. So it had a public school teacher. It's just all the white kids from the neighboring, you know, neighboring Villa Park uh, formed their own district so they didn't have to go into the co op. Eventually, the uh, the school district uh, built a, a modern uh, uh, school, which is still there today, a grade school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They also did have um, a nursery school as well um, on there. And so they were sending um, the children from a young age were going into a school environment as well. So that um, probably helped with, you know, getting that kind of leg up in life as well, the earlier introduced to kind of more formal um, educational settings. So it's probably one of my favorite photos we have is of the teacher with the kids um, 
she's reading to them and they're just adorable. It's uh, very much, I think it's one of the ones that ended up going in a newspaper. So it's a little stage, but they're just all in like their Sunday best dresses, these like three and four year olds. And they're just, they're darling in this photo. Yeah, yeah. Another thing I don't know, we didn't have much time to talk about was the committees. They, they got things done in the early co-op by forming committees and there was a bank. So if I came over and helped you with your plumbing, I got credit hours, uh, you know, or I could just write a check for my, you know, the, the hours that I had to, had to help. And so people literally built, helped each other build their own um, septic systems. They, uh, they had a committee for uh, uh, education. They had one for uh, roads, um, one for sewers, mm -hmm. you know, there was, everyone was on a committee. They, they, fought, they, didn't, they fought like cats they didn't, and dogs. They didn't seek out skill. So my guess is some moved there and the rest of it was just learned. Is that kind of the general yeah, thing? Initially they were academics. They didn't know, yeah. they didn't know how to use a screwdriver. Yeah. They, uh, uh, we won't talk about KU. <laughs> they uh, would refer to their bylaws as they, I was coming across this the other day. Um, they had the green book that transitioned into the red book, which was all of their bylaws. And I was looking through it the other day and it is just like the title pages of it. It's like four pages of listing, like all the different committees. And then it goes into their bylaws. And so they were very serious about we're going to make sure this community works and, you know, that you will, we will have the structure and the buy-in um, to make sure that literally the houses don't come down around them and, you know, uh, all the things that, you know, sometimes we take for granted uh, today building our homes and with the infrastructure that's provided to us. They did all of that from scratch, which is really incredible to think about, especially if they didn't necessarily even know how to use a screwdriver at the beginning, some of them. Yeah, my wife mentioned to me as, as a Chicagoan with that hot, same housing shortage, how nice the houses were. They weren't luxurious, but I mean, when, when she was Born, they were in. Uh, what, Maureen, unmute a minute. Well, what, 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 what did they call the garage that they turned into a house? Oh, um, uh, it's, it's like bungalow. It's a portmanteau. Uh, yeah, garage like, low, a garage, garage low, low, something. So people like, would actually come yeah. home from the war, turn a garage into a house, sell it separately, or your cousin lived there, or whatever and build a, divide it, make a few rooms, and you lived in a garage alone. So these were really nice. Yeah. There's a, a couple of those um, that go even older that are like carriage houses, because Lombard, um, being such a long and old town, has uh, houses that would have had the carriage houses. And there's a couple of the, I mean, even nice houses today that I know that uh, when people come in to do research with us, they're sometimes surprised to learn that, no, their house was not the original house. Their house used to be uh, the carriage house, even before we had, you know, garages and everything. So right. they uh, got very creative with where they were sticking people in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. May, may, I, may I share with you our new film? Please. We are, we're in production now on a, uh, we have in, in, in Illinois, they're called forest preserves. Uh, Cook County, uh, DuPage County, Will County, all of them got early on in the 1970s, started buying up land. They, they saw the sprawl going unchecked. And so they, they began uh, using uh, public dollars to purchase tracts of land. And today we have this amazing network of forest preserves in, mm -hmm. in, um, in the Chicago area. You can see them wherever you ever fly in, you'll fly over them and you'll go, wow, wow there's, look at all those woods. <laughs> you know, I thought we were in Chicago. <laughs> but <clears throat> next to my house is uh, one of the DuPage County Forest Preserves. And, uh, and so the documentary is called The Secrets of Hidden Lake. And it's the idea that whether you're in suburban DuPage County, Illinois, or Lawrence, Kansas, wherever you are, there's amazing history right under your feet. Um, you just got to, you got to figure out what it is. So 
our our forest preserve is a very nice forest preserve. It's nothing spectacular, but it was home for 200 years to the Potawatomi uh, uh, who lived there and were forcibly removed in the 1830s. Uh, so this, the secrets of Hidden Lake is the story of the land itself and uh, the Potawatomi who lived there and then the homesteaders who came in and saw it uh, through the eyes of Manifest Destiny as if they were the first persons that had ever laid eyes on it <laughs> um, and set up a mill and, um, you know, those kind of things. And then, uh, and then it, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was a guy from Guelph, Ontario in Canada that came to the Chicago Board of Trade and worked his way up from sweeping floors and became the second richest man in America, Arthur W. Cutton. He was known as the Wheat King. And uh, by 1929, he had amassed a fortune of $100 million. He had built an estate on the, uh, what's now Hidden Lake called Sunny Acres. And it, uh, um, at the crash of 29, uh, Cutton was accused, along with Jesse Livermore, of trying to corner the wheat market. And that was the catalyst for the crash. Cutton lost a reported $100 million in the crash, and uh, he he died a few years after the, in 1936, one of Al Capone's henchmen bought the property and lived there until Harry Truman pardoned him. Still trying to figure out why Harry Truman pardoned him. But uh, uh, he did in 1950. And then fast forward to the 1980s, the property had gone into disrepair and the forest preserve was looking to buy the buy tracts of land and they did and discovered two giant stone goddesses that were buried in the grass. And they excavated them and someone, some local historian identified them as having come from the Chicago Board of Trade, the facade. So they were <laughs> to the Board of Trade. And if you go down to the LaSalle and Jackson, uh, LaSalle Street, the famous uh, financial district in Chicago, there sit the two giant stone goddesses. So uh, the, the, book, the, the book end of the documentary is sacred and sacred. The Potawatomi saw the land as sacred. It was part and parcel of who they were as human beings. And they were symbiotic with the land. It was sacred to them. And today the Forest Preserve is in a sacred trust held by the DuPage County Forest Preserve. So all around it are warehouses from Amazon and corporate office parks. But that sacred trust with the public keeps that land open and available to anyone. So the secrets of Hidden Lake, if I can ever get the damn thing done. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say they found two statues at Jimmy Hoffa, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering, you know, the, it's, it's true that the uh, the IRS and the feds came in and, and dug holes trying to look, they, they didn't believe Cut that Cutton lost all his money. So they, they figure he buried some of it. And there, there was attempts to go out there and dig around, but nobody ever found anything. Uh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, they, those are, are... they are fantastic, the forest preserves. There's, there's one not too far from Moreland Park and the Little Red Schoolhouse is mm -hmm. in it, which is just a wonderful little nature center. I don't think it's as little as it was when I used to go. But it's it's a wonderful place, and the forest preserves are like a breath of fresh air in the middle of the city. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Ray, I I'm presuming we have missed it, and it's amazing considering we're kind of museum nerds. You have a museum up there that we can all visit. Yes. So or we at actually at least some of us who go up to Chicago. <laughs> Yes, so we actually have um, two different properties that we manage. So we have our main property, which is um, located at 23 West Maple Street, and all of our information is at LombardHistory.org. Um, that's where our archives and our uh, Victorian cottage um, is located. Um, and so we look at, you know, general history of Lombard, where we do our travel or rotating exhibits. Um, right now we have an Andy Warhol inspired fashion exhibit open. Um, and then our Victorian house looks at Lombard kind of at the turn of the century, late Victorian to about 1910. 
Um, and then the other property we manage um, is the Sheldon Peck Homestead, which is the oldest structure in Lombard. Um, and we like to say that that is a very modest house with a radical history um, because it is the home of itinerant folk painter Sheldon Peck, who is um, his work is in the Chicago Art Institute. It's in the Folk Art Museum in New York. Um, but more importantly, uh, it is a verified stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, so that's actually one of our documentaries. It's the first documentary in the series talking a little bit more about um, the story of Sheldon Peck um, as a radical abolitionist um, and the impact that that had on the community of Lombard. Um, and I know I also saw someone asking what our other documentary is. Um, and so the second documentary in the trilogy talks about um, this great lady named uh, Ellen A. Martin, who was the first woman in the state of Illinois to vote. Um, she was a lawyer um, and and she did 29 years before passage of the 19th Amendment. Yeah, so yeah, so we're doing it she in was a badass. Yeah, so she, <laughs> she was a lawyer before you were allowed to, women were allowed to be in the courtrooms. Um, and so she found a loophole that said all citizens can vote in the town charter. And it said nothing about the gender of the person voting. And so she wrote a legal brief, went and voted, and then they let the, her vote stand. So she turned around and brought 14 other women back. Um, and so that is uh, All Citizens is the second documentary um, as well. And so uh, Lombard is it's not a one off where we have, you know, the, like with the co-op, a very unique story. We definitely uh, history runs deep in Lombard and it's always really a pleasure to be able to talk about those stories. Um, so, yeah, if you are ever in the Chicago area, like I said, we're about 20 miles, literally kind of just straight west of the downtown. Um, and we've got uh, the two museums that people are able to visit. That's are the um, other documentaries also available like through your website or on YouTube? Yes. Or... Okay, great. Yes, and uh, like I said, uh, Jack, I will send you the links directly to those as well. Okay, that's yeah. great. And then I'll pass them to everybody who signed up tonight. So that would be, that'll be terrific. And, and I'll ask the question my wife is thinking about, do you have a gift shop and do you have <laughs> magnets <laughs> I do have a gift shop and I do have magnets and our gift shop is online so you can order and have it shipped directly to you. So uh, we, we like to joke, um, but it's a joke between my boss and I that just because we're a historical society does not mean that we're history ourselves. Um, so we do, you know, you take full advantage of modern history. I don't I don't have that old fashioned credit card scanner where you got to you do it in triplicate. <laughs> So, uh, but yes, uh, our website, um, LombardHistory.org, has our gift shop, has links to our blog, research, um, and uh, anything that you could want to learn about the history. We are the Lilac community. That's what we're known for. Yeah. Lilac? Yes, we have Lilacia Park. It's arguably one of the world's great collections of lilacs, and people come from all over the world to see the lilacs in May. If you're gonna come, come in May. Yes, we. Uh, there are the park across the street um, was donated to the was the first park um, officially donated um, by a gentleman with the last name of Colonel Plum, uh, and so he had. <laughs> at, I, I know it's a great last name. Um, I've heard all the clue jokes when I give the tours of the park, uh, but he at one point had 1,200 lilac plants on a about five acre property. Um, today there's about 700 plants and so it truly is uh, uh, pretty much one of it's where Lombard gets its identity and centers it around. So we do a parade every year. Um, there's I was going to ask there's there's a serious question but I want to going to ask do you have a lilac festival like the tulip festival in Holland? Yeah, so we have lilac time which is 3 weeks. So we have a lilac queen every year because we've been doing lilac time since 1930 was the first year. So there's been a queen uh every year since then. So when we say we are a lilac village, we mean that we are the lilac village. So uh, I smell really good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Lovely. I'm going to have to not schedule a bunch of stuff in May so I can find a few days to come up there. <laughs> I'm yeah. warning all of you, you may miss a couple of events because I'm going to be in Chicago in May. <laughs> Just insist on a road trip. There you, <laughs> there go. you go. Yeah. Trip. Uh, 
one of the uh, the serious question was how much has the film been shown throughout Chicagoland? Oh, I don't know. We we had how much has it been shown? It's on YouTube. It's on Vimeo. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know we've had a couple of screenings. I know, especially when the film first came out, there was a couple groups who did screenings. Um, I know I've also passed information along to teachers. Um, and so I know that there's been, there was a very, you know, large push initially. Um, I couldn't tell you, um, yeah. especially with it being on YouTube and people not having to be in the same, you know, go to a movie theater and see it. I really couldn't tell you how many people have seen it. Right. I love gotcha. to tell stories. I, I have zero interest in promoting them. By the time I finish one, I'm well on to the next one. And it's uh that's what you've got us for. We'll that's promote them. You're for. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. I I uh I cannot speak for everyone. I thought it was a phenomenal film, well made and really a great story. I learned a lot. Um uh others can chime in if you want to take yourselves off of mute. We're gonna just about close up now. So if you want to take yourself off of mute and applaud or say thank you, I really appreciate both of you being yeah. here and joining us. Very thank kind you. of you. Great film. We really, we really, uh, really appreciate it. It is our so, pleasure. And I look forward to the other two and then the, the fourth. It'll be very <laughs> interesting. Yes, we'll keep you busy. And we will visit the museum. Count Wonderful. On we look forward to seeing you guys all coming and visiting us. <laughs> when I say we, I'm talking about my wife and I can't speak for everybody else up there. We don't we don't have a bus. What can I do? Okay, tell? you. <laughs> Thank you very you much for joining us tonight. Thank all of you for being with us tonight. And uh, we'll see you at the next event, perhaps tomorrow night when we have another Zoom, which is uh, to, um, good for you nutrition. So that's uh, tomorrow at four o'clock if you've not signed up. And then Friday, we have a uh, coffee break in the morning for those of you who have not signed up for that. So thanks again <laughs> to our, our guests. <laughs> yes, we tried to do nonstop. Yeah. Thanks uh, to all of our guests, and we really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.